Over there's Lou Island off the dramatic coast of Cornwall. And to say it's got a romantic history is an understatement. You can't move for stories of shipwrecks and pirates and monks and ghosts and treasure maps. Pilgrims frequently lost their lives in these waters on the trip to a chapel on the island, which has now vanished. Here in Lou, we're investigating a story of two chapels. In the medieval period, they belonged to Glastonbury Abbey, the important Somerset monastery famous for cultivating the legends of King Arthur and Joseph of Arimathea. And according to local legend, it was Joseph of Arimathea who brought Jesus Christ to Lou Island and left him to play in the safety of these beaches while he went off to do business with Cornish tin merchants. If people really did believe that Jesus played here when he was a lad, that would have got people flocking here, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, that would have driven a whole pilgrimage industry of people coming out here to see, you know, and the support structure for it. It's just that sort of thing that people travel around to, to visit. So you're really champing the bit now, aren't you? Well, of course I am. I mean, the point is that, that time and tide are the two things that wait for no man. We have got to get off of this island by early afternoon. And we've only got half our diggers because the others are, I don't know if you can see, just round the headland there, up on that hillside. What are they doing there, Mick? There's another chapel over there, halfway up the hill, and they're, and they're said to be the same size. One's said to be a copy of the other one. But the mainland chapel has been excavated already, hasn't it, Phil? Well, that's right. I mean, partially dug, at least. I mean, in the 1930s, some local Cornish archaeologists went in there. They were slightly eccentric ideas. They were desperate that it should be pre-Norman, and they kind of labelled it Celtic. Yeah. What do we mean by Celtic, Mick? It's a shorthand term in the West Country for something that's after the Romans, but before the Normans. But, of course, we don't have Anglo-Saxons in this area, so it, it's, it's a short-hand term for that Dark Age period. And there are maps dating back to the 16th century showing a chapel right on top of the hill. Right, that should be our excavated area in between these strings, so if you want to start stripping the turf off of that, that'll be fine. Thank you, Newt. So, with time in short supply, Phil's confident enough to get going without GFIS results. And Stuart's nose for earthworks has sniffed out what he thinks is a nave for the pilgrims and a chancel for the altar. You see, Phil's getting a bit of a wall coming out through there, which rather suggests that that's probably the first block, mm -hmm. with perhaps that added on to it. Right. So, what do you think the timeline might be? The very early, what they call Celtic, chapel would be wood and we just yeah. find post holes yeah. then what if we're lucky we find post holes and then we get a stone building on top of that which is pretty small and pretty featureless and then somebody comes along and revamps that with some nice architectural pieces perhaps doorways chancel arch windows in the 12th century that would be my guess as to what we'd see on the site the structures themselves could be the best clue we have when it comes to dating because chapels don't have the domestic rubbish that we usually rely on to date buildings. Hey, Phil, that trench is coming along, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it looks like we've got the beginnings of a wall, Tony. I mean, we always knew that there were those big stones just immediately underneath the turf, but now we've got it stripped off. You can see there's a nice edge there, but we really need to be able to get down to confirm that that is a wall. We certainly can't date it but we can begin to suggest that it is a chapel. Jackie was showing me some bone earlier on. What you got, Jackie? The bits that are really of interest are the pieces here. Now, these are bits of human femur, and it's quite a, a large individual. You can see these ridges running down here. This is where the big thigh muscles attach, and they really are quite rugged. So this is quite a large individual with quite chunky thighs. So we've got the mystery of a big-thighed person <laughs> somewhere on this <laughs> island at some time. And he might not be the only burial here because human bones are said to have been revealed as the cliff faces have eroded. <laughs> Glastonbury acquired this land sometime in the 12th century, and legal documents suggest that there was already a chapel on the island at this time. At the chapel on the top of the island, it looks like we've found a potential north wall. And Ian's put in a new trench looking for the west end. On the other side of the water, we found steps coming down the hillside into the chapel on the mainland, chunky stone walls, and a floor surface carved out of the rock face. It seems to be deliberately terraced into the hillside at exactly the same height as the island chapel. 
Isn't it weird looking back at our chapel from this chapel? It is, and yet this is strangely familiar. I mean, when you look at the size of this chapel and you think about the earthworks over there, they are very, very similar. Can you see this, what looks like a wall running here? You, the, there's almost like face stones coming through. Well, they're actually floating on top of this dirt. We need to get to grips with this wall to find out whether there was a nave here before Glastonbury added a chancel. And Bridge and Oliver have now found some post holes that might prove Croft Andrew's theory that this nave was Celtic. It would have been a hell of a job cutting through that rock, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I haven't excavated them yet, but having stuck my trowel down, they're at least the steep. So do we think we've got our earlier chapel, our early timber chapel? If you're very, very lucky. On the other hand, yeah. of course, they could be late. They could be post-dissolution, yeah. for all we know. Yeah. But we've also got this other new feature that just come up, which may support an earlier structure. Um, can you see down here? We've yeah. got this wee gully, <laughs> yes. and it's been actually cut into the stone. It's at a right angle, and that could well be a timber slot for an earlier building. And that's in line with those post holes as well, isn't it? Absolutely. Pilgrims who made it safely to the island chapel believed that St Michael would reward their bravery with time off purgatory, and were just beginning to uncover the nave where they would have stood. Phil, I think I might have a piece of in situ flooring here. Good Lord. Yeah. And, and it, that is exactly the same sort of surface that we had on the Mainland Chapel yesterday, wasn't yeah. it? That was, was, was a mortared surface, just like this, and it's patches directly on the natural bedrock. And right. this wall, too. I look, this wall here. So what, what angle are we on there? Where's, where's well, north? I, I, hang on. Here we go. I'll tell exactly what angle we are. Hang on, east-west. Don't get much better than that, does it? Don't get much better than that. This wall's convincing because chapels generally face the east, often orientated to the sunrise of their saint's day. Now we can really get our teeth into working out what it might have looked like. 1590s, all these lovely ships. Yes, right that's amazing. Um, because this is, is showing the disposition of the English and, and Spanish fleets at the Armada. Right. It, it's a yeah. story map to some extent. Yeah. But you can see along here, we've got what's called St Michael's Island at that stage. But it still shows a chapel. It depicts it with a tower. But I, I think you have to take that kind of with a pinch of salt. We've got the wall now. It is bang on east-west. Right. Now, the interesting thing now is what is happening in here. Because we've got all this, these stones are mortared in. So this is actually masonry. Right. Now what I don't know, and I'm trying to resolve, is whether or not that wall comes along and turns. In other words, we're actually in the northeast corner of the chapel. Yeah. Or whether it's actually a big sort of swelling to take a, a buttress or a big column that might support a chancel arch. Like the big stones we've got over here, in fact. Exactly. Yeah. And now you see, down there, Matt had another wall. Yeah. Now, we did wonder at one stage whether or not that might be the south wall of the chapel. But now we've actually cleaned it up and looked at it, you actually see that it's on a slightly different alignment, it's southwest to northeast. Right. So I'm rather hopeful, if it worked out all right for me, we'd have a wall coming here, be the northeast corner of the chapel. Yeah. This is the chapel. That would be a separate building outside it. If Phil's right, the island chapel could be much smaller than the mainland chapel. So the theory that they were mirror images is looking a bit shaky. Beginning of day three here at Loo in Cornwall. We've got a chapel on the island over there. We've got another one at the top of the hill. And this morning we're going to open the stone-lined burial we found yesterday. One day left, and frustratingly, the tides won't let us out to the island for a couple of hours yet. Jack is already hard at work on the possible grave in the mainland chapel, because whoever lies inside it should be an important figure in our story. It's all a little bit strange. Strange in what way? It's very narrow, but mm. I think actually it's, it's narrow, it looks narrow because of the pressure of material pushing down on here. You can see the stone here is angled. I suspect it was originally further over there. But I think we might find that there's something underneath these. I'm probably going to have to take those out. Where do you think the end might be then, Jackie? Well, you can see how the soil changes completely there. So I think it actually could be right over here. Given its position within the church, it could be a storage area for reliquies. Although one what might... are reliquies? It's usually some kind of box or other kind of container in which you would store things like the bones of saints in your church. Further down the hill, 
Rakshar has found the missing wall of the monk's house that we were looking for yesterday, and it's a pretty substantial building. We've got lovely coursing down this side, Sorry. and we've got another one here. You can actually see this line going across here, so that's the inside of the building. The standing remains show a two-storey building. Croft Andrew found two small bedrooms for our monks, and we found the back wall of a refectory, which would have been used by pilgrims waiting to get to the island on feast days when they really did make a day of it. Well, I don't think we've got anything in there. This is an extraordinary find. Relics beneath the altar would have been displayed on feast days, drawing pilgrims to this chapel to make offerings. Frustratingly, the bones have long since been removed, so we can't date it. Jackie, I've got bone here. But in a different part of the chapel, Bridge thinks she's found another burial. And it's human. Part of the human foot bone. You've got look to it's have a, more oh, down there. Yeah, there is a lot down here. You can see it's ranging from here to about here. Yeah, so that looks like it's in situ. It's not moved anywhere. So where's the grave cut? Well, I think that these two large stones here, which end about here, mark one side of it. Mm -hmm. And what I've been thinking of as a wall here is actually marking the foot end of it. This gets better and better. The small wall was Glastonbury's chancel, and this means that Bridges' burial could well be related to an earlier chapel. And now Oliver's convinced he's found it. Well, the evidence, we've got these two whacking great yeah, yeah. post holes in yeah. front of us, but the killer piece of evidence is the fact that they align really nicely with the rock-cut feature stretching off into the distance there, and the fact that together they're on a different alignment to the walls right. that we can see, only by a couple of degrees, yeah. but I think it's significant. If Oliver's right, it means a wooden chapel was here before the Glastonbury monks arrived. And the exciting news is that if Bridges' burial is related to it, a bone sample could actually date it. It's all getting pretty exciting over there, apparently, so we're going to leave a skeleton crew on the headland, which is fairly appropriate, I suppose, and the rest of us are going over to see what's happening. After we left, it seems our archaeological hermits made the most of their island experience. The big news is that Matt's found a burial carved into the bedrock. Ian thinks he's finally found the west wall of the chapel. And Tracy's cleaned up the possible standing stone. So, ah, you've got a grave cut, haven't you? This is it here, look. You can see it cut into the shale going all the way along there. There's a wider head end coming back down here. Do my eyes deceive me, or is that a very big bone? That is a very big shin bone. There's his foot there. Um, unfortunately, no knee bone and no sign of a thigh yet. Do you think it might belong to the same person we found on the first day? Well, well in a way, I hope not, because that would mean the burial's been really disturbed. Disturbed or not, if he's buried inside the building, he could be a significant figure in the chapel's history. That's a really curious-looking wall you've got there. It's quite a complicated story because here you've got this plaster here, and you can see the line of the wall continuing through here. So I think that this stone is actually added on, which implies to me that this is not just one chapel that was built and then that was it. Periodically, it was refurbished, it was strengthened, it was modified. It's a very, very long story. And part of that story, the addition of the chancel, is exactly the same as we found on the mainland. But this isn't the only similarity. It looks like Matt's burial is in the same position as the reliquary in front of the altar. If only our big-boned man could tell us when he was buried. Because we're running out of time to work out just how long this story is. But with a few hours left, we're putting another trench in. Because Stuart spotted a ditch running all around the top of the hill, which might give us an idea of how long a chapel has stood here. We're only just below the surface, and already we've got yeah, some yeah. finds. I, I, it's certainly medieval at the latest, um, mm. probably earlier. It is handmade. Just to uh, throw a spanner in the works. Yeah, okay. just, well, that's not, a, that's just found not a, a Roman radiant. <laughs> <laughs> that may influence my decision about the pot. <laughs> <laughs> this could actually be a Romana British shirt then. It looks like we're heading further back into the time of the Cornish saints, because the latest theory is that our burial and reliquy are from an even earlier chapel than the one Oliver found, which Glastonbury probably revamped by adding a chancel. 
And if so, pilgrims could have been coming to pay their respects to relics in this box long before Glastonbury's time. Meanwhile, the island has turned into a hive of activity. Kerry is trying to lift the possible standing stone without much success. And it's all going on in the oval enclosure where we've been pulling out a coin every eight minutes. So far, there are six. Jonathan, that means one more coin and you've got another hoard to your name. You've got one beautiful coin here that you can clearly see the figurine of a goddess on the back. Back on the lawns, the huge stone doesn't want to stand up, so Kerry's now burrowing under it. It's smooth underneath, Tracy. So I don't think there's anything under there. I think we can go for the standing stone. Exciting as this is, it's undateable. These are medieval shirts of Polk. One's actually got a little spot of glazing, so that helps me a little bit. I think these are mid to late 13th century. So how does that fit into the, uh, the history of the island and this chapel, Nicholas? Well, the late 13th century is when Glastonbury is giving up this site and bringing the monks back. But it's possible that this is one of the last monks or priors of the place. And if it's not that, it's the Lord or Lady of the Manor. It's clearly a very important grave. It's being excavated out of the rock. It's at a pole position in the church. And Matt's burial isn't alone. Just as we're packing up, outside the west end of the chapel, Ian's found what looks like a kissed burial. But you're going to be staying here anyway, aren't you? So will you let us know at some time what it was? Sure. Cheers. Matt, we've got to go, like, now. OK, let's go. Even as we're loading onto the boat, another kissed burial emerges from under the south wall. Cheers, mate. Cheers, Tony. Thanks for having us. Cheers, you're welcome. It's beginning to look like this enclosure could have been a burial ground for thousands of years, maybe even into prehistory. Over the last few days, we've discovered that the story of our two chapels began long before Glastonbury's monks arrived, when Lou Island could well have been one of the earliest outposts of Christianity. And a chapel on the top would have been a beacon of hope for traders from the Mediterranean crossing formidable seas. Sometime later, another chapel was built on the mainland, at the same height looking to the island, with our reliquary box at the altar for pilgrims to visit. And eventually, in the 12th century, Glastonbury's monks rebuilt both the chapels as a sort of St Michael theme park. Over the last three days, we've just scratched the surface of this magical island, which has been a very special place going way back long before Christianity. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses, and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. Burford in Oxfordshire is one of the finest medieval towns in England. Almost every house here is picture postcard perfect. And the granddaddy of them all is this one, the Priory. This sprawling mansion is being restored with great care because underneath it is thought to lie a medieval hospital. But that might just be the start of it. The owners called in our very own Mick Aston, who stumbled across something rather surprising in the garden. So the fact that we're here is all down to you. Yeah, I'm afraid it is, actually. I, I, I was asked to come here and look at this building and then wandered off and looked at the grounds around it, thought it was really interesting and we ought to come back and do more work. I bet you're great to employ. You are asked <laughs> to look at this fantastic place and you're poking around the back. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a medieval uh, hospital on the site, but up on the hill at the back, we found 10th century pottery. So that's Anglo-Saxon? Yeah. When you say you found it, where was it? It, it, was, it was in the vegetable patch on the top of the hill, but it's earlier than the date of the town of Burford when that's found in the 12th century. So there's something here that much earlier. And finding that was sufficiently exciting for you to come to us and say, I really want to dig it. So, medieval hospital or Anglo-Saxon settlement? It looks like Mick's got us looking for both in this massive garden. That's over a 1,000 years of history to sort out. At least our search for the hospital should be fairly straightforward. 
Fingers crossed, John's radar has picked up part of it under the front lawn. It means we can put in our first trench straight away. Our second target is the vegetable garden, and it's going to be a lot harder. This is where Mick found his mysterious Anglo-Saxon pottery, and he wants us to scour it for more. It's not exactly small, so we've called in some extra help. Welcome back to Burford in Oxfordshire, where we're trying to uncover the secrets of Burford Priory, the biggest house in town. Down here, we think we may have the first glimmerings of a medieval hospital. Why are we so sure that there are likely to be medieval remains here? Well, the archaeology doesn't just stop at the front door. Excuse the mess, this is the incident room, by the way. But look at these arches. Now, even I can tell that these are medieval, but what puzzles me is that it all seems far too grand to be a priory. Antonia, you know more about this place than anyone else. You actually wrote the book on Burford. Is this really a priory? No, it's a private house, and it has been for the best part of 500 years. So why is it called a priory? Because it stands on the site of a medieval hospital. But one's a priory and the other's a hospital. There seems to be some confusion over the name towards the late 15th, 16th century when even the records refer to the Priory or the Prior of Burford. What's our earliest reference to the hospital? Right, the earliest reference is this close roll of 1226 in which the King grants to the Hospital of St John in Burford ten cartloads of wood from the Forest of Witchwood. But in addition to the medieval stuff, which we're pretty sure is here, Mick's been getting very excited about the idea of Anglo-Saxon finds. Is it likely that we'll find anything Anglo-Saxon? Oh, I hope so. I Why? Hope so. The place named Burford is Saxon in origin, and it relates to the ford leading to or by the Burr. And what's a Burr? A Burr is a fortified enclosure, um, which would either have been used in times of stress when people could use as a refuge, or it might have been inhabited. OK, so the name's a good Anglo-Saxon clue, but that's all we've got. So far, but fingers crossed. So, apart from the odd leftover arch, the big house bears almost no resemblance to the 13th century hospital. As lovely as it is, this building dates from the 1580s. Our best chance of finding the hospital lies under the front lawn. And out back, we're also going to see if we've got some kind of Anglo-Saxon settlement. The question is, which one will we find first? Phil thinks he's made a good start. He's found stone. But he's being given a run for his money. Because in the vegetable garden, our junior archaeologists are coming up trumps. That dates from about the time of William the Conqueror. So that's really, 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 really old. So that's great. I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, you've been doing this for about 10 minutes, have you? Something like that. So that's both digs off to a good start. But the sheer size of the Priory Garden is a challenge in itself. It's one of the biggest we've ever dug on Time Team. It's got rows of topiary, Victorian flower beds, even a 17th century chapel. And that's the problem. It's so big, we could find anything here. We've got half a dozen trenches open in the vegetable garden alone. And we're getting a lot more pottery, most of it late Saxon, early Norman. Oh, marvellous, look at this. The tent. There's a clear cut-off date around 1100. But we still don't know where the pottery's coming from, so we've got to keep digging. Yeah. Over on the front lawn, Phil's row of stones has turned into the corner of a large wall, which lines up perfectly with the geophys. Could this be our medieval hospital? Well, some 13th century hospitals could be very big, but most had two main buildings, a long infirmary hall for the sick and a chapel, either on the end or on the side. So which one does Phil have? You can't tell whether you're outside or inside there, can you? Oh, surely I must be inside. I mean, that's got to be an outside wall, or at least part of an outside wall, and then turn round and go in round there. I'm sure that must be outside, and I'm on the inside. And just to prove Phil doesn't make this stuff up, look at this lovely floor tile. It must mean we're inside a building. 
This is exactly the sort of thing you'd expect to find in a very posh 13th, yes. 14th century yes, building. It is, isn't it? Like yes. a chapel. Yes, yeah. yes. So this could be one of our hospital buildings, the chapel. And the second, the hall, might be closer than we think. Oh, yeah, look. Well, you better have a good reason for dragging me up here. No, I have. I have. Because you can see the whole town from here, look. Cool. And look something. across there, look, there's our hospital, the Priory site, look. From here, you can really clearly see how there's quite a substantial hill behind it, can't you? Yeah, where the trees are at the back is where the Saxon pottery's coming from. But then in front of us, you've got all this medieval new town laid out. Uh, you know, you come over the, the ford, over the River Windrush down there, and then you've got the main street up the middle, and you've got all these carefully laid out properties running back from that. When would the new town have been built? Well, this one's about 1100, uh, which is quite early, because there are literally hundreds of them founded in the 1100s and 1200s. Everybody's at it, because you can make money out of building a new town. We, what's actually happening is that's the earlier settlement. It's probably one of a number of the villages down this valley. And then the town is built and people move from there into the town. That would make sense with what we, what we see. So we're beginning to see the big picture. It looks like the creation of the new town killed off our Saxon village. It's now mid-afternoon. Faye's uncovered most of her Saxon house and she's also narrowing down its date. Well, it's Cotswolds again, but it's really crude. So Cotswolds, that's the Anglo-Saxon stuff? Yeah, yeah, but, I mean, it's really unusually thick and heavy. Um, we get stuff like this in the Midlands that's Middle Saxon, but not in this fabric. I've never seen anything quite like this before from this part of the world, and I've seen an awful lot of pottery from this part of the world. Well, that's good. We've got a first for you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and that, what date would that, that be? That would be 650 to 850. I mean, that's perfect, because that actually that dates then our beam slot. So right. we've got a Middle Saxon building. Oh, so this is from the beam slot? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting, because, I mean, if you look at Middle Saxon buildings in places like East Anglia, they're, they're, they're really quite vague structures. What you basically get is a couple of very faint, shallow beam slots where there's been wooden beams set in the ground, and then upright timbers jointed into them, and then the whole superstructure built around that, and all they basically leave is two very faint sort of gullies. Which is just what we've <laughs> which is got. what you've got, yeah. So it looks like our timeline is really clear. Our site starts off as a mid to late Saxon settlement, which disappears when the town's built in 1107 and is followed by the early Norman hospital. And then a trench which so far we've overlooked suddenly pushes our story even earlier. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. Welcome to the castles, a massive stone enclosure the size of a football pitch. And for once on Time Team, there's plenty of archaeology on the surface. So what's the big mystery? With 5,000 tonnes of stone right in front of us, this should be easy. Well, in fact, for hundreds of years, this site's baffled everyone who's seen it. It's been called everything from an Iron Age homestead to a Roman prison to a Dark Age stronghold. So what was it really? When was it built? And who was the king of the castles? We've only got three days. Is that enough time to find out? The remains of the castles lie near Hamsterley, 20 miles southwest of Durham in the Weir Valley. Sitting on the side of a hill in a sheep farm, the site's a huge dry stone enclosure measuring approximately 70 by 90 metres. Now overgrown with trees, its crumbling walls still form a monumental structure. But even so, no one knows what it is or when it was built. So the team stormed the castles, with our environmental archaeologist Emma beginning to core the enclosure ditch. This is the best place to find organic remains which might give us crucial dating evidence. While Emma gets her first taste of the site, Stuart's scouring the perimeter of the enclosure to see how the stones stack up in the landscape. And Henry and Phil begin to survey the wall to find a location for a trench, 
because if we dig down to the foundations and uncover the ground it was built on, we might reveal some finds to give us a date. We're also putting in another trench across the north wall, hoping to learn more about its construction and locate the early ground surface and datable artefacts. By digging on this side, we've got less stone to shift, since the wall's least built up here. So John's hooked up with Frank the farmer to tap into his local knowledge and see if he can narrow down a target. But there's evidence of ridge and furrow ploughing from the past in here. Well, I would say the ridge and furrow would be done in the 1800s. They've left this area in the middle. I would say the reason they have left it was because they've obviously hit a, an obstruction. In Hodgkin's report, yeah. um, he claimed that uh, they, they dumped stones in the central area here when, when they'd cleared it because it was so wet. But yeah. if you're clearing land, you, you wouldn't put your stones right in the middle. You'd go to the side. You, you'd go to the periphery, especially when you've got all this area to, to dump your stones on. So this could be a good target for us to look at in the first instance? I would say it definitely does need looking at, yes. John begins to geophys the interior to find evidence of internal structures. Since working out a date's one thing, but understanding its function is even more of a challenge. In the entrance, we're trying to discover if there's a second guard chamber. But since the castle's is basically a massive dry stone wall, it's hard to tell fallen rubble from standing remains. Does it have had any, any kind of bonding material at all? Well, sometimes with these dry stone structures, they used to put clay bonding, almost like a putty, in between right. the stones. But it washes out with the rain. I think you're still in rubble there, actually, Matt. The longer we're here, the more of a mystery this place seems to be. It's one of County Durham's least understood sites. What are the stories about it? In the first century, this area was occupied by the tribe of the Brigantes, and their relations with the Romans were quite turbulent at times, and the theory goes that the castles could have been a refuge when they were defeated in a major battle near their main base near Stanwyck. What else? Um, another one is it was a Roman penal colony uh, where slaves working in neighbouring lead mines uh, were kept. Now, both of these suggestions are theoretically possible. We're not that far from Stanwyck, and there are lead deposits in the area but there's no real evidence for either. So it's one of those things where people tell a story about a place and after a while everyone just believes it? Yes, it's sort of fiction becoming fact or speculation becoming fact. The castles is steeped in legend, but this just increases our challenge to separate the fiction from the facts. Stuart, this place is called the castles and you've got this massive stone wall here and you've got this big gully here which looks like it ought to be defensive but if you look up there you would imagine if it was a castle it would be nestled right on top of it but it isn't it's almost as though it were in the lee of the hill you sum this site up really well because it's not defensive at all is it i mean you could you could stand on that slope there and almost lob a flaming torch straight inside that enclosure absolutely it's not a defensive feature it's chosen for other reasons it's a bit like iron age stone cladding that's the best way to think about it. People are starting to show off in the landscape, demonstrating this is their area. We won't properly understand it until we start to look at its location in relation to the stream, valleys, the hill slopes, all around. It's called the castles rather than the castle. Do you think originally it would have been lots of separate structures? No, I think that's, that, that's a red herring to some extent. It's just how farmers refer to things that they didn't quite understand. It looks, it looks like a collapsed castle to them, so they call it the castles. It's of no significance whatsoever, that name. In the interior, the archaeologists have opened two more trenches on the site of the antiquarian's old excavations. Their central position is the most likely place for occupation. Hodgkin had found stones here, and we want to check out whether they could be evidence of structures. As the new trenches get underway, our north wall trench has come to its end. So I see Naomi's doing the recording here. Does that mean we've finished with this trench now? Yep, we're closing this trench up. So what did you decide in the end? Well, actually, it's really interesting. What we've actually got is them using the natural slope. So right. here, what Naomi's sitting on is actually the natural. Right. And it That's all orangey, down. yellowy stuff yeah. down there. So is that set back into the mound then? Yep. Yeah, it is. And the $64,000 question, any fines from it? No, you were right, none at all. Yesterday, we concentrated all our efforts on the exterior walls so that we could understand when and how they were built. On the north wall, Faye thinks that she might have located the original ground surface and is still searching for any datable finds. 
We're also beginning to learn how the site was constructed as Naomi and the team clear tons of fallen rubble from the southern wall. While over at the entrance, we've moved mountains to expose the gateway. But how does it fit in with the original guardhouse? Why did we put this trench in? Well, this is slap bang in the middle of that big geophysical anomaly that John picked up. And we, we actually positioned the trench so that we thought there was going to be a wall line going slap bang through the middle there. I can't see a wall line? No, it doesn't look like there's anything here. What about the trench down there? Yeah, well, come down and have a look at it. Well, there doesn't seem to be much more in this one. Ah, well, you see, the idea of putting this one in is, is working on the assumption, as Francis said, here we are in an Iron Age enclosure. Where is the most likely place for the building to be? Now, if you look back through there, we are slap bang in line with the main entrance. In fact, we are slap bang in the middle of the enclosure, which is the most likely place for the high status building. Now, if we assume that, that anybody but Mr and Mrs Clean and Tidy was living here, you'd expect to find some traces that they lived here. But we know there was ploughing here. Couldn't it be ploughed out? Ah, this trench is placed on a ridge, so the archaeology is more likely to be preserved underneath it, and the furrows are on either side. Afternoon of day two, and with no internal structures or finds, the castles is still frustratingly mysterious so we're throwing every means of investigation at the site. Emma's still coring. And we're opening another trench in the interior. But over at the southern wall, the archaeologists may have made some progress. Really pleased about this, Mick. We've actually yeah. got the bottom of the wall. Look at that. Oh, good. It's actually sitting good. on that yellow natural there. Yeah. So is it on an old ground surface down there? No, it's not. Right. And that's really interesting, because it means that they're going to have to have cut into the slope and created a kind of linear terrace to build it on. And the reason they've had to do that is because I mean, we've now been able to measure from face to face, yeah. which is another good thing, 5.1 metres wide. Crikey. It's, it's a hell of a thing, isn't it? That's interesting, because when I was talking to Faye about the, the top rampart that's parallel with this. They did the same there. Oh, really? So it means yeah. they, they, they terrace that top in, they terrace this one in. I wonder what they did with the sides, because they run up the slopes. So they're either going to have to have got a sort of ramp effect yeah. cut, cut in, or they're going to have to have done it in yeah. a series of steps, aren't yeah. they? So, still no date, but at least the archaeology is consistent. Both the northern and southern walls were built on terraces into the natural hill slope. It's just so frustrating we've got no idea what the walls were enclosing. Are you two seriously trying to tell me that that jumble of rubble at the bottom of that trench could actually be the first archaeology that we've got inside the structure? Well, I think it could be, Tony. Um, the trouble is, those stones down there are actually inside Hodgkin's trench, so we don't know whether there's something left there by him or whether it's the remains of a collapsed wall or something like that, but it's the closest thing we've got, I think, to archaeology in here. You wouldn't like to hazard a date? Mm, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but tomorrow we'll know. Tomorrow we'll yeah. know. Welcome back to this mysterious stone structure called the Castles here in County Durham. And after two really frustrating days, we're finally managing to sort out the guard house, the walls and the interior. Meanwhile, Emma's been eating dirt in a desperate attempt to sort out the environmental archaeology. I have indeed, Tony. And how have you been getting on? Up till end of day last night, not particularly well. But yesterday, at the very, very last moment, I found a piece of preserved wood probably at a depth that we actually be quite interested in. No. Nope. Just that tiny piece there. What is it about this piece of wood, then, that's so significant? That piece of wood lets me know that there might be seeds and insects that I can use to sort of establish what was happening when this site was occupied. So what are you going to do with this now? I'm going to take it to the river and I'm going to process a sample and we'll see what we get. So, beginning of day three, and finally we might be able to date the castles. While working with 6,000 tonnes of stone, it could be a few grams of organic material which will give us an answer. We're also beginning to expose more stonework in the interior to reveal its function. 
a lot of archaeologists in a relatively small space. What's yeah. going on? This middle area has suddenly got more exciting, and so we've brought a lot of people in to help with it. What's so exciting? Um, well, the main thing is that big spread of blue clay yeah. that we had in what well, we thought in the middle of the house there. Um, it's turned out to be a tree throw pit. That's not very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> what about the post hole? Yes, it's a feature, and it may be a post hole. This excitement is almost defined by the lack of anything exciting. <laughs> ah, but Tony, over here is real excitement. Oh, well, these stones, there's so many more of them now, aren't there? Well, yes, Tony, but the key thing is the stones over there, they're well bedded in, and look, they form a distinct curve. That looks like a semicircle. You've got a curve of stones, and that can only mean one thing. What? Well, a roundhouse? A roundhouse. What do we need to find in order to prove that it's a roundhouse? We need to find that there's occupation in the middle, and that's why we're stripping this area over here. What might we find, Francis? Well, if this is the centre of the roundhouse, then you're going to get a hearth, or with any luck, you might get a sort of spread of ash from the hearth. But there'll be something here. I mean, we're keeping our fingers crossed. This is our last chance. We've got to go for it. It's our last <laughs> throw of the dice to see if we can actually find this in the middle. So it's possible that we've got a roundhouse in the centre of the enclosure. But how does that fit in with the idea that the site's Iron Age? We're also extending the trenches in the middle of the interior, where we're hoping to expose a hearth or post holes, which will confirm whether we've got a roundhouse. Meanwhile, Emma's finally found some organic remains which might provide us with dating evidence. But will the paving slabs in the entrance be equally rewarding? There you go. It is, not so. Ah, ah there's cobble. Ah. ah, no then. Well, that's quite good, isn't it? Cobbles underneath. Yeah. So that's yeah. continuous with this lot of cobbling? Yeah. Ah. That puts quite a. Yeah. Big camber on the road, doesn't it? Does, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. All of our paving. We now know that the entrance was built with a finely cobbled surface covered with paving slabs. This is a heck of a long trench. What have you done to justify it? <laughs> well, we've got both sides of the original wall now, from that flat flag to that. It's 5.1 metres. We've bottomed the wall on each side and de demonstrated it sitting on a terrace. It's a deliberate, artificially cut terrace overlooking this, this slope down. If we've got that edge there and that edge there, but then on top of that you've got all this rubble, mm. doesn't that imply that originally the wall would have been much taller? Oh, yeah, five metres wide width just screams height to me. I, I, three metres wouldn't amaze me as an original height. And that, overlooking that valley, would look incredible from that far side. That's almost as tall as you. <laughs> what have we got on this side? Well, Naomi's just putting in a little extension there. What's the extension for, Naomi? Well, Tony, as you can see, we've got these stones here. I know there's stones absolutely everywhere, but these stones are much flatter. They look much more purposeful as opposed to those tumbled, angular stones over there. So what are you going to do with them? Well, we want to take this back and just see if we've got something real. Don't those look rather like the ones that we found up there? Well, that's the whole point, really. The way they're pitched and the size of the stones, even in the material they're set in, they're pretty much exactly like the stuff in Faye's trench up there. So, do you think it could be something like the base of a roundhouse? Well, we're hoping so. Fingers crossed, yeah. We can only check it out, can't we? We can only hope, yes. <laughs> <laughs> After two and a half days of struggling to find any evidence of occupation, we might have found not one, but two roundhouses within the enclosure. Our potential roundhouses fit in perfectly with our Iron Age model. But as digging continues in the interior, things are beginning to go pear-shaped. Yeah, that now looks like a bit of a bend at the end of a straight line of stones, doesn't it? It's not looking very roundhouse-like, more like a boat. <laughs> yeah, and also we've got more stones coming behind me. Yeah. Um, oh, so yeah. I think we've got quite a bit more work to do. All very well, but it's nearing the end of day three and there's still loads of work to do to confirm whether we've got our other roundhouse by the southern wall. Earlier on, our environmental archaeologist, Emma, got really excited about one patch of soggy earth down there. I have, absolutely. Um, this is the best waterlogged deposit we've got from the site. It's going to have the seeds and the beetles in that I need to tell us what was going on in the enclosure. How do you know they're seeds and beetles from a long time ago? Why couldn't they just have dropped here in the last couple of years? Well, they're sealed by the topsoil and they're at the same sort of level as all the floors across the site. Would you like to see some? Yeah, yeah. There you go. And are there any seeds and beetles in here? There surely are. Would you like to see what I found? Yeah, yeah. 
Well, we got seeds that suggested that there's a lot of activity and disturbance in the enclosure, which could be humans or animals. But we also got beetles, and we've got a specific sort of beetle that's associated with accumulations of like quite nasty sort of waste associated with human habitation and dung and manure. So that's what this earth's made of. There's a good chance. Thank you for sharing it with me. So these are the stones, Mick, that we thought were part of the it's roundhouse. A lot cleaner now, isn't it? Well, it is. It's a lot cleaner, but as it's been cleaned up, we've seen that these stones are straight and form part of a rectangular building. Right. Right, right. so um, it's, it can't be Iron Age, I don't think, but at that end, it's cut by those furrows. So what date are they? 1780 was when this land was enclosed, so... Right, so a pre-18th century building, but, yeah. but, but not Roman or medieval, presumably. No. No, um, I think you're looking at something a little bit earlier than that, uh, earlier than the medieval. You have that cell thing over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That might be Dark Age. So it looks as though any Iron Age roundhouse that might have been here has been ploughed away. And instead, we found a square, potentially Dark Age structure, which would have been contemporary with the Dark Age guardhouse at the entrance. Tony, you've been fettling away all day trying to sort out whether this is just a tumble of stones or whether it could be something to do with the Iron Age people we think yep. lived here. Have you come to any conclusion yet? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's structural now, Tony. Why do you say that? Well, the stones are nicely laid, they're nicely flat. They have exactly the same relationship to the underlying ground surface as does the main enclosure wall. They're just covered with this um, hill wash. But these stones here, they're not really flat, are they? No. That could be the wall which encloses these uh, these flat flagstones. So what do you think they might be? Well, we've got the geophysics um, just in this area. We've, yeah. got a, we've got a nice square edge on each side of it, just about under the polythene there, a little way that way. So it's not a roundhouse? It's not a roundhouse, but it could be something like a stockyard, something like that, a, a sort of rectangular stockyard under the shelter of the wall. It's great that at last we've got some kind of structure inside our enclosure, isn't it? It's a real relief. Yeah. It's absolutely great, isn't it? Although this roundhouse has also turned out to be square, we still believe it's Iron Age since it was built at the same time as the enclosure and was probably used as a cattle pen lying in the shelter of the wall. So our three-day siege has brought us closer to untangling the age-old mystery of the castles. The enclosed farmstead was built in the Iron Age. Its five-metre-thick stone walls would have stood three metres high and the eastern entrance was fronted by two massive stones flanking an impressive wooden gate. There would probably have been a large stone roundhouse positioned opposite the gate. Stone cattle enclosures were built in the shelter of the walls, which would have protected the livestock. Later in the Dark Ages, the gate was modified and a substantial guard chamber added. The central roundhouse was replaced by a square building. This is our best bet for a building. But what strikes me is the contrast between the massive presence of this monument in the landscape and the few fragments of evidence we've got for the people who lived here. Even though I'm standing right by something they built, the only things that we've found that have got anything to do with the people are these tiny bits of beetle. This monumental structure has been an enigma for centuries, but by pulling together a team of experts, from archaeologists to stone wall builders, we're at last clearly beginning to see its identity, even if the identity of the people who actually lived here remains tantalisingly just out of reach. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.